I don't believe that traditional moralists are wrong. I just uh, don't like them uh, when they try to control everybody and everything and to control us 24 hours a day. We've just been uh, watching one of my favorite films, W.R., The Mistress of the Organism, which everyone tended to call The Mistress of the Orgasm, I remember at the time it came out. And uh, it's part of a series on censorship. And it's censored by you, <laughs> which seems to be so incongruous. How did you come to allow it to be censored and even voluntarily take part in that censorship? So I would not call it censored, I would call it it's my version, my TV version. I understood that uh, television is not the same as movies. Movies you go, pay the ticket, sit there. So movies you go voluntarily to. And television being in everybody's home, very often uninvited. I understood that tele in television you have to behave. So when I was asked if I would accommodate the film for television, I would prefer this film to be shown, say, one o'clock by night without any changes. But it seems they wanted to show it a little earlier. But that would Just suggest that at, t at 10 o'clock or shortly afterwards, the innocent go to bed and, yes. and the corrupt stay up, you know? And I do think it's a pity. Uh, that it had to be censored, although you did it very wittily, I have to say. Look, I think that whatever, uh, you always have to, you play games all the time, you always have artistic strategy, you know, whatever you do. And uh, it's not only a question of fighting powers that would not let us show this or that. You know, you have to struggle to tell the story properly, you have to struggle to, to get it not to be boring, you know, the all kind of things when you do something that you have to take care about. So you also have to take care about excess. Let's take a specific case here yeah. in the film. Uh, there is a scene of those girls, groupies, I think they were, in San Francisco, was it, who um, had a studio, and in the days when rock stars were considered the essence of uh, sexuality, you know, they invited them along and gave them erections and then made plaster casts of their penises. That was one of the scenes that is censored in the film, yes? That's the scene, actually, the girl that is in the film, she was the first one who did it with Jimi Hendrix. Mm. And then it started from Jimi Hendrix on. It became a kind of a, a cult, thing. A cult thing. So the girls sometimes would come with their favorite stars and pay for, for the cast mm. to be done. So I was thinking of the assumptions of it. The assumptions are uh, and the fact that it had to be censored, uh, had to be, was censored. It was not cut, cut out of the film. So yes. It's clear what is it, but it's just not I shown know, everyone completely. can see what's happening behind yeah. the squiggly bits. An ending is there, so you see. What but it, what is it about the male organ in erection, in your view, that makes it such a taboo object? I think it's not only taboo object in films. I think that in, there are things in, in, that we never watch in normal lives. You know, people undress only for the beach and people undress when they're alone. So I think that the, the control of, num number of things are controlled in regular life too. Mm. And I don't believe that we have control only of, of things sexual. Now I think we have a control of things that are uh, em emotionally charged or people that, that are considered subversive like sex is considered subversive and it, has, it is really a powerful force in our lives so it has to be regulated, it has to be controlled. There's so many things that, that are regulated but we just don't see that they are regulated until the regulation gets broken by some unusual behavior. Yeah, but nonetheless in the film itself yes. <laughs> you showed this scene without squiggles all over it. Well, yeah, but it was important for me to show it because the whole film was dealing with some kind of... Uh, uh, there were all kind of things that I wanted to deal with in the film. And first, the film was dedicated to a man whose life was uh, quite tragic. It's Wilhelm Reich who could not uh, stay in one country. He practically changed seven countries in the period of his life. He died at the age of 60 in American prison. 
and he even didn't die for any offense. He but they were suffer. really after him for his views. It was McCarthy period, they would not say that, but he was one of the marked men in the period. Mm. And now what happened, unfortunately, he didn't show at the court because he was offended and he said, it's not up to the judge to judge my work. My, judge, my work should be judged by, by doctors, by, by sci scientists. <coughs> so he didn't show up. So when he, second time, he was ready to show up and he was advised by lawyers not to be arrogant and go. The court used the case that he did not show up first time. So he was punished. He got two years of jail for contempt of court. And there was no way to appeal because mm. contempt of court was done by his not coming. Yes. So there was no discussion, you know. But they also so burned, he died his, in jail. They burned his books. And so I thought, look, I, speaking of the film, I thought that film should be a specific kind of homage. But it was, it was done in the 60s, so I thought that it, this homage should not be done without some, let's say, with some joking, and with some irony about his utopia. And because part of his utopia was actually came from the communist utopia, or Marxist utopia, I, I knew that I have enough material to make jokes about. And I extended my, say, my, my target was not only Reich with his naivete, political naivete, but also Lenin, Stalin, and some other sacred cows. Yeah, you hit out pretty broadly in that film, don't you? Yeah, I think we had a lot of fun doing it, but some people got quite mad. WR, for instance, with its, uh, its free sexuality, its, uh, its uh, uninhibited attitude, you see, since the coming of AIDS has become a different film in a way, hasn't it? The, the fact that death came back into sex is very important because if you understand that in older times, when sex that was not permit, that was not blessed by the church or by society was punishable, and you know the girl that would stay pregnant uh, out of marriage would kill herself very often, or people were really heavily punished for doing things out of the regular frame. That was very much present and controlling the freedom and behavior. And people who, adulterous people, were really playing in something very dangerous. Uh, so I think that this danger that was lost because sex became kind of uh, entertainment. So we return to a, a more general question. Your work is very much of a piece from the first film to the most recent. It's not, uh, uh, it, it's, it presents your views interpreted through a metaphor or through a, a story or through fantasy or through reality or whatever. What would you say, if you can say it, and it's quite a difficult thing to say, was your general philosophy of what you try to transmit through these moving images we call the cinema, what you were trying to say to the public? It's a hard one, isn't it? I'll tell you what, why is it hard on, because I never believe, when I listen to somebody explaining what he wanted to say, I never believe him. And be, being somebody who's, like, I'm a passionate film viewer and I like to read books and I watch plays, and you, all, you always know that whatever artists wanted to do is something that you discover. And sometimes you have even stupid, sometimes writers are stupid when you talk to them. See, they're stupid, but they're very intelligent writers. So creative people don't have to know exactly what they're doing. I'm not saying that God is talking to them, or some, but something is talking through the artist. I think that the uh, work of the artist is a formal work. You know, you, you have to you create an interplay of certain forms. Yes. Now, is it characters in, in a story through the action, or is it an uh, interplay between background and foreground, to use the, uh, say, uh, gestalt, uh, Terms and is it uh, people and landscapes, close-ups and wide shots, uh, zooms, movements? But it's always formal game. It's always formal work. What you do, uh, of course, you always claim that okay, this is the story I want to say. But the story is always a pretext. Story is always a trigger. Story is always something that will help you and the crew to get into creative work. Nevertheless, uh, you. Uh your films come across, at least to me, as saying something pretty concrete. Say, 
that sexuality is, uh, f is freeing and good, that oppression is grim, gray, black, bad. Uh, sure. You have a, 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 a something I would like to ask you, is your political f view. I mean, you're not exactly an anarchist, as Reich was, and yet at the same time you oppose the monolithic aspect of Marxism, and yet I feel that you have some uh, belief in Marxism, if only it could alter itself. Uh, uh, you're not a, a right-wing yeah. person. I mean, it, it, no, okay. you seem to be in a very special position, and I wondered what it was. Now, if you force me, like, I don't know like whom I would vote now, because now we have in Yugoslavia about 100 different parties, and neither one is really yet uh, arti articulate enough. But I would be somewhere on the, uh, on the le left, democratic I think that I'm basically liberal and democratic in my my personal views I'm also an, quite anarchistic because I like freedom and I like uh, humor and uh, I like things that are not regular so but I would not be like uh, you know I when people explain to me that anarchists are the guys who are putting bombs in you know trash bins, and I, I really hate uh, random violence, or I hate any kind of violence. Yes. So, so I don't know how to define myself politically, but uh, obviously something comes from my films, and whatever you read th there, I think it's legitimate. You yourself, of course, have been the victim of censorship, uh, sometimes in a, in a very amiable form, like this evening, sometimes more directly, like when your films were banned in your native land, Yugoslavia. You've been banned on political grounds and on sexual grounds. Do you think that, in fact, censorship really treats the two more or less as equal? Yeah, I think that they're interchangeable very often, and uh, I think that, uh, say, a democratic society is more nervous about sex because they have no ways to change, uh, to, to, to change political opinions. You know, people are entitled to their political opinions. But uh, sex being some kind of wilder part of man is still much more regulated. So I think that uh, sexual offense is very often used as an excuse mm. for actually chasing somebody for his views. Well, they think of sex as very subversive. It is, because it is wild. It is not, uh, you know, it, it's, it's unpredictable. You know, sometimes you would do things that you would never, never do, but uh, you get some, you have these age impulses, and uh, because you're animal too, so you break, you break the law, you break the rule. Do you find it more difficult to work in a democracy than under a dictatorship? Sure, you never know where you're going to be hit from which side, because in, say, in, in a monochromatic society, like one party society, when party, police, army and government, all of it is together, you just have to find a proper fable to to express what you want to say. So you have to find the proper metaphor. Uh, I remember when I was in Greece, I was very surprised to see uh, a regular, uh, you know, the guys who carry things, and it says metaphora. Because in, in, in a Greek, metaphor means just carrying something from somewhere to somewhere. That's, I never realized that. That's marvelous. <laughs> it says metaphora, and that's the guy who carries your suitcases. So the very fact you have to find a metaphor in what you call a uh, monochromatic society, yes. a dictatorship. You have to find a metaphor which people will be able to read and understand what And everybody what knows how to read. Also. Yes, everybody does. It's kind of consensus. Yeah. Of course, the authorities know how to read too, one has to say. But, you know, they let you do things because they can't chase you for everything. You know, they, you know, they, they have kind of points that are sensitive and there, is rest, there are things that you can say if you don't say directly. I think there is this kind of unwritten agreement. There is some kind of gentleman's agreement. Mm. Like you can make jokes about, you can't make jokes about our president, but you can, you know, there's something else you can do. They're, they're, it's a strange game. It's difficult to say. Sometimes they would catch you for something very naive. It's a game you've played for many years.